Who are the three greatest African leaders in your opinion? If Nelson Mandela does not make your list, it is incomplete. But how did a boy move from tending sheep to writing his name not just on the pages of history, but on the hearts of Africans and people all over the world? There is a statue of Nelson Mandela in Palestine. There's a statue of Nelson Mandela in Europe. Why do so many believe that Madiba was the last of his kind? I mean, he gives himself prodigally on behalf of others. He's probably the one leader in the world whose morality uh, and leadership is completely unquestioned. There have been numerous African leaders mired in the same liberation struggle that shot Madiba to fame. What makes him special? Welcome to another episode. And in this episode, we tell the story of Nelson Mandela's journey to immortality, alongside the freedom story of the black people of South Africa. In the rolling hills of Mzvezu, South Africa, a child entered into the world on a Crips Monday in July 1980. Born into the Tembu royal family, the air was dense with the spirit of celebration. Before this child drew his first breath, fate had already ordained him. Roli Lala, the name he was given in the playful Zosa tongue, meant troublemaker. Little did anyone know. This seemingly ordinary birth was the beginning of a legend that would echo in the hearts of all black people even after it ceased to live. Mandela lived, and sure enough, he made a lot of trouble. Nelson Mandela's early life unfolded in the village of Kuno. Taken to live within his mother's kraal, he shared his childhood with two sisters. Morning was spent herding cattle, a common duty for boys his age, while evenings were spent playing outdoors with friends. Though his parents couldn't read or write, his deeply religious mother ensured a different path for her son. At around seven years old, she enrolled him in a nearby Methodist school, setting him not just apart from his mates, but also placing his feet on the path to his destiny. No one in my family had ever attended school. On the first day of school, my teacher, Miss Indingane, gave each of us an English name. This was the custom among Africans in those days and was undoubtedly due to the British bias of our education. That day, Miss Indingane told me that my new name was Nelson. Why this particular name? I have no idea. His father came to stay with the family at Kunu, but the reunion was short-lived. He died before Mandela turned 12. The death of his father sounded like the bells of change in Mandela's childhood. His mother whisked him away from the familiar comfort of his village to the opposing great palace in Inkezuwane, where he became the ward of the Tembu regent, Chief John Jingabata the Lingyabu. Though years would pass before he saw his mother again, the chief and his wife, Nguyen embraced Mandela as their own. He joined their children, sharing not just a roof, but also a deep Christian faith, nurtured through Sunday services. The Methodist Mission School next to the palace offered lessons in English, Zosa, history, and geography. Mandela's curiosity flourished, especially when he came to African history. Tales from elderly visitors filled his ears, and a visiting chief named Joyce packed his interest in anti-colonial ideas. Young Mandela initially viewed the European colonizers as figures of progress, believing they brought education and advancement in South Africa. He began his secondary education at Clarkbury Methodist High School in Ngonkobo, a Western-style institution in 1933, with an ambition to become a lawyer for the Tembu royal family. Clarkbury was the largest school for black Africans in Tembuland. It would be the first time Mandela would associate with non zozas He began playing sports and developed his lifelong love of gardening. Mandela completed his junior certification education after just two years. In 1937, he moved to Herald Town, the Methodist College in Fort Beaufort, attended by most Tembu royalty. While the headmaster hammered on the superiority of European culture and government, Mandela became increasingly interested in native African culture, making his first known Zosa friend a speaker of Soto and coming under the influence of one of the favorite teachers, a Zosa who broke taboo by marrying a Soto. 
Mandela spent much of his spare time at Herald Town as a long distance runner and boxer. And in his second year, he was made a prophet. With the support of his guardian, Chief John Jintaba, Mandela, now 20, began work on a BA degree at the University of Fort Harry, an elite black institution in Alice, Eastern Cape. It was there that he met and became friends with both Kaiser Mantanzima and Oliver Tambo, who would go on to become lifelong friends. Despite having friends connected to the African National Congress, advocating for South African independence from British rule, Mandela remained uninvolved in the fledgling movement. When World War II erupted, he became a vocal supporter of the British war effort. However, his academic journey took a detour. In his first year, he participated in a student council boycott protesting poor food quality, resulting in suspension from the university. He never returned to finish his degree. He learned to his sorrow and quite early too, activism had consequences. Upon his return to the palace in Kokezweni in December 1940, Mandela found that John Gintaba had arranged marriage for him and his foster brother, Justice. Dismayed, they fled to Johannesburg. Mandela soon found work as a night watchman at Crown Mines, where he had his first sight of South African capitalism in action, but was fired when the headman discovered that he was a runaway. Things were looking grim, but going back to an arranged marriage was not an option he would consider. Forced out of his studies, lacking a job, Mandela found himself homeless. A cousin in George Gorge Township offered him refuge, and through him, he met Walter Sisilu, a realtor and crucially, an ANC activist. Sisulu, a key figure in the very movement Mandela had previously avoided, secured him a job at the law firm run by a liberal Jew sympathetic to the ANC's cause. The twist of fate placed Mandela at the heart of anti apartheid movement. Exposure to communist party gatherings without racial barriers left a deep impression on him. While his Christian belief prevented him from joining the party because of its roots in atheism, the experience chipped away at his earlier distance from the ANC. He enrolled in a correspondent course, earning his bachelor's degree at night while working as an articled clerk. Finally, a change of heart solidified. Abandoning his childhood dream of becoming royal advisor, Mandela returned to John Ernestburg, ready to fight for justice as a lawyer and more importantly, as an advocate for equality within the ANC. In prison within a segregated education system, Mandela's world had been confined to the black schools that he had attended. Attending law school at the prestigious white-dominated Witwatersrand University shattered that reality. There, as the only black student, the black reality of apartheid unfolded before him. He, a black man, stood at the base of a rigid social pyramid. Indians occupying an unjustifiable middle ground with whites loading over them all. Every interaction served as a stark reminder of his supposed inferiority. This daily injustice for Mandela's defiance, but not through violence. Instead, he found rebellion in an unexpected place, befriending those people the system deemed superior. At Witwatersrand. stand, Mandela met Anton Lembede and immediately fell in love with his views on black-led oppositions to the apartheid regime. Together, they met with Alfred Bettini Zuma, the leader of the ANC, and decided on the need for a youth wing to mass mobilize Africans in opposition to their subjugation. The African National Congress Youth League, ANCYL, was founded on Easter Sunday, 1944, in the Bantu Men's Social Center, with Lembede as president and Mandela as member of his executive committee. This marked the beginning of Mandela's active participation in the struggle against apartheid. In October 1944, Mandela married Sisulu's cousin, Evelyn Massey, who was a nurse trainee at the time. Their meeting was facilitated by the ANC's meeting. Mandela attended a Sisulu's home. Their first child, Madiba Tembi Tembikeli, was born in February 1945. A daughter, Makaziwe, was born in 1947, but died of meningitis nine months later. 
Segregation had been a constant shadow over Mandela's life in South Africa. Though he had noticed the unfairness as a child, it wasn't until he came of age that the full weight of apartheid settled upon him. It was the reason he was the only black student at his university. But even that discrimination paled in comparison to what followed in 1948. The Africana Nationalist Party rise to power, secured through an election where only white could vote, ushered in a new era of brutality that surpassed the horror that had come before. The Nationalist Party codified and formalized these racist policies into law. It strictly segregated people into separate classes based on their skin color, putting the white minority in the highest classes and all others, including the blacks, indigenous, multi-races and descendants of indigenous Indian laborers below them. Although apartheid had been a thing, it was the first time it was backed by a legislator and pursued as a state policy. Our policy is one which is called by an Afrikaans word apartheid. And I'm afraid that has been misunderstood so often. It could just as easily and perhaps much better be described as a policy of good neighborliness. Accepting that there are differences between people. But while these differences exist and you have to acknowledge them, at the same time, you can live together, aid one another, but that it can best be done when you act as good neighbors always do. Mandela's rising influence within the ANC coincided with the political upheavals of 1948. In response to an apartheid tightening his grip, he championed more forceful tactics like boycotts and strikes. This clashed with more moderate approach of President Zuma, who was ultimately replaced by James Moroka. The new leadership, including Mandela's allies, Sisulu, Nda, Tambo, PJ, reflected a shift towards a more militant stance. While his dedication to the struggle bolstered his standing in the ANC, his academic pursuit suffered. Repeated failures in his final years at Witras time forced him to abandon his law degree in December 1949. Mandela took Zuma's place on the ANC National Executive in March 1950. That same year, he was elected national president of the ANCYL. And through a series of conventions and defiant campaigns, the ANC grew in popularity. Mandela became a known voice against apartheid. And there in as politics was, it did not put food on the table. Things were beginning to look grim at home. Accused of adultery, his relationship with Evelyn had been strained. He worked briefly for Teblanche and Brigish before moving to the library run Hellman and Mitchell. Passing qualification exams to become a full-fledged attorney. In August 1953, Mandela and Tambo opened their own law firm, Mandela and Tambo operating in downtown Johannesburg, the only African-run law firm in the country. It was popular with aggrieved black people, often dealing with cases of police brutality. When the ANC and other organizations called upon people of all races to gather in Cape Town to approve a Freedom Charter, which was to be the blueprint of a democratic South Africa in 1955, Mandela could only watch from the sidelines as he was banned from attending any public gatherings, let alone to speak to a crowd. Still. When the government came after the organizers of the Freedom Charter, he was not spared. They were charged with high treason. The trial, designed to keep the opposition preoccupied, dragged down for almost five years. The Freedom Charter would bear no fruit till another 40 years later. When protesters from black neighborhood of Shalville gathered to protest in 1960, the police opened fire on them, killing 69 people and injuring a score more. The apartheid government banned all opposition and declared martial law. Believing to have exhausted all non-violent options, Mandela went underground and founded the Mkonto Visizwe, Spear of the Nation, abbreviated MK, the unofficial armed wing of the ANC. The Africans require, want the franchise, on the basis of one man, one vote, they want political independence. Do you see Africans being able to develop in this country without the European being pushed out? We have made it very clear in our policy that uh, South Africa is a country, a country of many races. There is room for all the various races in this country. 
uh, it has been proved in history that uh, people can enjoy the vote even if they have no education. Of course, we desire education and we think it's a good thing. But uh, you don't have to have education in order to know that uh, you want certain fundamental rights, you have got aspirations, you have got uh, claims. It has nothing to do with education whatsoever. Are you planning any more campaigns of non-cooperation? Yes. The Peter Marisbeck resolution makes provision for campaign of non-cooperation with the government and we are presently studying plans to implement this aspect of the resolution. The MK sought to bomb the military installations, power plants, telephone lines, transport links at night when civilians were not present. Mandela stated that they threw stable touch because it was the least harmful action. It did not involve killing and offered the best hope for racial reconciliation afterward. I was caught in the very first action. You know, because we were ham-handed, we were very, uh, very much, very amateurish. I mean, the bomb, the so-called bomb, the, the um, explosive charge that I placed in a magistrate's um, court in Johannesburg, I mean, it was infantile. So, and the way we did the operation was very amateurish. And all our people who were involved will tell you, you know, we were total amateurs. I mean, the way some of our people, you know, when some of our people were instructed to go and learn how to make a bomb, what did they do? They went to libraries and read books because we didn't have the know-how. Barely a year on from when ANC leader Lutili was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, MK publicly announced its existence with 57 bombings on 16 December 1961, followed by further attacks on New Year's Eve. The battle line had been drawn, and from here, there was no going back. Just when the MK was beginning to gain momentum, Nelson Mandela was arrested on August 5, 1962 with the CIA assistance and jailed in Johannesburg's Marshall Square Prison. He faced charges of inciting worker strikes and unauthorized travel, having left the country disguised as a chafua to Ghana international support. The situation went from bad to worse. When police raided Lily's left farm one year later, Uncovering documents detailing the underground activities of MK and Komto Rizizwe. Some of these documents reference Mandela and its other top ANC officials, including Sicily. This was real trouble, for Mandela and his comrades faced a possible death sentence. When the proceedings began, Mandela made this speech. I have fought against white domination. And I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the idea of a democratic and free society in which all persons will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an idea for which I hope to live and to see realized. But my Lord, if it needs be, it is an idea for which I am prepared to die. This watch echoed past the walls of a courtroom and ignited a wildfire in the heart of black South Africans. But it was not enough to save Mandela and his comrades, who were sentenced to life imprisonment and taken to Robben Island. At the moment, Nelson Mandela seems to be the only hope. I mean, though his position is almost impossible, but the people are still hoping that it'll be possible for Nelson Mandela to come out of the island and lead the nation to further liberation. Mandela was 45 years old when he became prisoner number 466 of 1965. Given the acronym 466-64, he would be 71 years before he could breathe the air as a free man again. Even in confinement, Mandela was still subject to racial abuse from the white wardens at Robert Island Prison. Uh, Colors and Indians uh, receive better food than ourselves. 
and uh, Africans had uh, the poorest diet, as you would imagine. In fact, uh, we live on millipop in the morning, millis for lunch, and millipop in the evening. What is millipop? Can you explain it to the well, audience? Well, you know, it's a millis ground and cooked. Like a porridge. Like porridge, you see? Yes. To someone who has no idea what Robben Island is like, do you remember the first day or the first night when you were taken Oh, yes. Uh, although I'm very reluctant to talk about that because uh, I was directly involved and uh, we had a clash with the warders who came to fetch us from Cape Town and across uh, the uh, sea to Robben Island. They wanted us uh, to rush, and, uh, uh, and they lined us up, we were four of us. I was uh, at the back with another comrade, and there were two others in front. And, uh, and they uh, were very harsh. And then I whispered to my uh, colleagues that, look, we must fight right from the beginning. They must know what type of men we are right from the beginning. The Rivona trial prisoners spent their days breaking rocks into gravel till they were reassigned in 1965 to work in the lime quarry. Mandela was initially forbidden to wear sunglasses and the glare from the lime permanently damaged his eyesight. At night, he worked on his LLB degree, which he was obtaining from the University of London through a correspondent course with Wesley Hall, Oxford. By 1975, Mandela had become a Class A prisoner, which allowed him greater numbers of visitors and letters. He corresponded with anti-apartheid activists like Mango Sutu, Botulezi, and Desmond Tutu. That year, he began his autobiography, which was smuggled to London, concealed in his correspondences, but remained unpublished at the time. Prison authorities discovered several pages, and his LLB study privileges were revoked for four years. He devoted his spare time to gardening, and reading until the authorities permitted him to resume his LLB degrees in 1980. While Mandela and his comrades were in prison, the struggle for a free South Africa continued. The international community joined its voice against the apartheid government. With protests erupting worldwide, British Labour leader Hugh Gaskell condemned apartheid as an evil and repulsive thing, reflecting the growing global outrage. Inside South Africa, 1976 saw Soweto school children march in protest, spiking violence in townships across the country. This marked the beginning of the end of apartheid, but freedom wasn't immediate. The Nationalist Party clung to power for another decade, despite escalating violence and economic stagnation. International pressure mounted, with multinational banks withdrawing investment and leaders like Margaret Thatcher urging the release of Nelson Mandela, then at the height of his international fame. However, Botha, being Mandela's a dangerous radical, offered conditional release in 1985 only if he renounced violence. I'm not prepared to talk to people who want revolutionary change. If Mandela were to say he that he not, wanted constitutional he change... He does not want it. We believe in a system of private initiative and we will protect it as far as it is humanly possible. Mandela, ever resolute, replied and said, only free men can negotiate. A prisoner cannot enter into contracts. Recovering from tuberculosis, exacerbated by his dam cell, Mandela was transferred to Victor Versta Prison near Peel in December 1988. Enjoying relative comfort with a personal cook, he used his time to complete his law degree. He also received permission from many visitors and even conducted secret communication with exiled ANC leader Oliver Tambo. Meanwhile, South Africa's political landscape was shifting. In 1989, a stroke forced Botha to relinquish leadership of the National Party, paving the way for F.W.D. Clark. Recognizing apartheid's unsustainability, D. Clark released ANC's prisoners and met with Mandela in prison for a friendly discussion. This signaled a turning point. I call on the international community to re-evaluate its position and to adopt a positive attitude towards the dynamic evolution which is taking place in South Africa. Following the fall of the Berlin Wall, de Klerk legalized all banned political parties in February 1990, culminating in Mandela's unconditional release and the first published photograph of him in South Africa in 2 
decades. I stand here before you not as a prophet, but as a humble servant of you, the people. Following his triumphant release in February 1990, a frail but resolute Mandela emerged from prison to a hero's welcome. The world watched as he stepped out, blinking in the sunlight after 27 years of confinement. Negotiation with the Clark government began soon after. These talks, fraught with tension and challenges, aimed to dismantle apartheid and establish a new democratic South Africa. Mandela, ever the peacemaker, insisted on reconciliation and forgiveness. Even as violence continued to flicker across the country, the years that followed were a period of intense political maneuvering with the signing of the historic Gross Screw Minutes in 1990 and the subsequent Convention for a Democratic South Africa CODESA negotiation laying the groundwork for a multiracial election. Finally, in 1994, the moment South Africa had been yearning for arrived. In a landmark election, Mandela leading the ANC emerged victorious, becoming the first black president of the nation. This historic ascension marked the end of an era and the dawn of a new rainbow nation. The time for the healing of the wounds has come. The moment to preach the cousins that divides us has come. The time to build is upon us. We have at last achieved our political emancipation. We pledge ourselves to liberate all our people from the continuing bondage of poverty, deprivation, suffering, gender, and other discrimination. What should have been a well-earned retirement was spent pursuing the ideals he had since held, presiding over the transition from apartheid minority rule to multiracial democracy, Mandela saw national reconciliation as a primary tax of the presidency. So help me God. Having seen other post-colonial African economies damaged by the departure of the white elites, Mandela worked to reassure South Africa's white population that they were protected and represented in the Rambo nation. Despite an ANC-dominated government, he appointed de Glock as deputy president and included national party officials in his cabinet. Although the constitution allowed the president to serve two consecutive five-year terms, Mandela stepped down as ANC president at the party's December 1997 conference. He gave his farewell speech to the parliament on 29 March 1999. To the extent that, that I have been able to take our country forward to this new era, it is because I am the product of the people of the world who have cherished the vision of a better life for all people everywhere. Although opinion polls in South Africa show wavering support for both the ANC and the government, Mandela himself remained highly popular with 80% of South African polled in 1999 expressing satisfaction with his performance as president, Mandela insisted to step down. Stepping down in 1999, Mandela remained a powerful voice for social justice beyond his presidency. He focused his energy on his foundations, the Nelson Mandela Children Fund and Nelson Mandela Foundation. This organization tackled issues close to his heart, such as education, healthcare for children, and promoting peace building initiative globally. Mandela also continued to advocate for HIV AIDS awareness, a cause he championed throughout his later years. His unwavering commitment to social good cemented his legacy as a global icon for human rights and reconciliation. In his final years, Mandela battled recurring respiratory infection. Hospitalized several times through 2012 and 2013, his health remained fragile despite successful medical intervention. In September 2013, he was discharged but never fully recovered. Tragically, this prolonged respiratory illness claimed his life on December 5, 2013, at the age of 95. The world mourned his passing, with South Africa declaring 10 days of national mourning and a state funeral attended by global dignitaries. His many friends around the world, from both the high class to the normal citizens, cried and mourned for this great man. For Mandela was definitely one of the greatest Africans to have walked this earth. At his funeral, it was the who's who of the world. His funeral was in commemoration of a life well lived. When finally the curtain is closed at the history of Africa in this millennium, the name of Mandela cannot be forgotten. 
for he more than anyone fought for the freedom of South Africa and did it with peace in his heart. And having achieved freedom, he refused to oppress his former oppressors. Instead, insisted on friendship. And it is no surprise that everyone around the world loves Nelson Mandela. Thank you for watching this episode. Until I see you again, bye-bye.